My name is Seth Kamebwati and I'm a broadcast journalist uh, with Multimedia Joy News in Ghana, Accra. I was invited by the Fordham University uh, Law School. They had a human rights program here. I spent two weeks in New, New York and, uh, and as part of the training, uh, my documentary on the prisons, the latest one, Let to Rot, was premiered in New York and we had a number of people come around to see for the first time the terrible and inhumane conditions in our prisons, I mean Ghana. Yeah, in 2015, I released the first one. The title was Loved and Forgotten. Um, that was the genesis of my uh, prison, uh, if I should call it ministry. Um, so I told that story about the plight of especially remand prisoners in our prisons. Uh, we had nearly 3,000 remand prison prisoners in our prisons, and some had been there for over 10 years. Some had uh, lost their yeah, some officers can't even trace their docket, their warrants, and all those things. And some they don't know the whereabouts of their investigators or prosecutors. So I told that story, and through that, the Chief Justice activated a program we call the Justice for Our Program, where judges are sent to the prisons to uh, to hear cases of remand prisoners. And through that, um, almost all prisons in the country, in Ghana, were visited by these judges. The Chief Justice as well dispatch all judges in the country uh, from every region go to uh, a prison in your region and see the conditions there so that when you are sentencing people you would understand where you are sending them to. Through that documentary over 200 people got their freedom so that's what I'm talking about and I produced another one a sequel to Loved and Forgotten the title is Left to Rot and that one I looked at what the government and other bodies promised doing when I released the first one. So I did a follow-up on the promises they made and I found out that um, just about 1% of the several promises they made have been realized. I've never been to the prison uh, as a prisoner and I've never had any uh, relative um, go to the prison. But what I can say is that um, um, 2014, I had a chance to travel with the then Interior Minister, Mark Oyongo. He was going to Navrongo, the Navrongo prisons. I had the opportunity to go there with him. When I entered the prison, I was shocked. Looking at the, the kind of um, people who were there and their condition, uh, the food they were eating, the, no water to bath, no water to drink no soap and everything, I was shocked. So I asked the minister, you mean all these people are Ghanaians, they vote and they are human beings? He said yes, and I said, and they live here under this condition, he said yes. So I asked, would you give me the opportunity to enter the prisons with my cameras and tell the story of the conditions here? Since uh, I'm beginning to realize the situation has overwhelmed the government and there seem to be nothing they can do about it. So why don't we tell the story so that people who want to help will come in and help? So I was given the chance by started from the Kuma, Sawam, Kumase, Sunyane, and Tamale prisons, where I told stories of the inhumane conditions and the human rights abuses in our, in our prisons. So that informed me, and I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to draw attention to the apply so that we will start thinking about the prisons because it can be anybody's home. I have been saying that it's anybody's second home. You don't know what you do to take you to the prison. And you might think that well, I'm here maybe in the States, I'm in China, I'm in the UK, so I should not be concerned about the plight of our prisons. You know, it's like a community. There are a number of diseases there. When I was doing the first documentary, Locked and Forgotten, I wasn't wearing lens. I went in there, the few days I spent in there, I came back and I had infection. So I had two alternatives, either to go for a surgery and get it corrected, or wear this lens to correct it, um, wear this for, for some time and get it corrected. So I mentioned the kind of diseases, the airborne diseases and all forms of diseases there. You know, we have prison officers who work there. They interact with these inmates, they pick up some of these diseases, 
they go out to their homes, they set in commercial vehicles, they will spread this disease, you will pick it up, you also go home, uh, give it to your children, they will go to school, and it will keep on spreading. That's why we must all be concerned about the, the prisons. They were shocked. You know, the pre uh, prisons are always closed, so you don't get to see what happens in there. Those who will tell you what is happening there are the inmates, and they were shocked and scandalized. They were asking questions like, so you mean these things are happening in our prisons? Um, why must people, uh, el elders, uh, like those over there, be fed on one CD 80 pesos? That is less than 50 cents in US, in America. Uh, why must they be fed on that? And why must we keep people there for 10 years without trial? Why must we have thousands who have been there and they have not been convicted? These are some of the questions they, they asked. And apparently, not all the judges even knew the conditions in there. So they were also shocked. They kept asking questions. You mean these things are happening in our prisons? It was the reason the president of Ghana, John Mahama, visited the prison for the first time. And he made history. It was the first time a, sit, a, a president of Ghana, a sitting president, had entered the prison when he went to the own prisons to see for himself conditions there and he also made promises as to what they were going to do to deal with some of the issues I raised in the first documentary. So people were shocked and they it became an issue which um, which continued in the country, a discussion which continued in the country to the end of uh, 2015. Uh, I've had a number of meetings I, through that documentary or uh, it was partially through that documentary that the US State Department invited me to the state um, in October 2015 to be part of uh, some hundred best journalists in the world they selected for a training here in the, in the United States. Um, I've attended a number of meetings, conferences. Uh, I'm here in the States um, because of that documentary uh, is the reason for the university invited me. I've had a number of uh, international bodies who are willing to come down and help Ghana because of that documentary, because it's online, it's everywhere, and people get the opportunity to see. And uh, I've had the government also uh, 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 make commitment as to how they plan dealing with the issues. So, yes, I made impact in Ghana, and I think outside Ghana to some impact have been felt. I had interactions with a number of um, the foreigners who came there, some uh, asking me to come to the organizations or their schools to, pre uh, to premiere that documentary or screen that documentary. Some compared situations in, in prisons here in America to that of Ghana and they realized that we are, still, um, we are still in the slave trade business because if indeed we claim to have abolished slave trade, why must we have people sleep in a room like 120 people sleep in a room meant for just five people. So we had that discussion. And I had the Association of Ghanaian Lawyers who were highly represented. They were also concerned. And they have decided to also send lawyers down anytime we have the Justice for, for a program running in Ghana. They're also seeing how they can get bodies uh, in, here in the United States to come down and help our prisons. So all these things are some of the things we got from the premier in, the, in New York. It's about um, sending judges to the prisons to hear cases of especially remand prisoners, people who are pre-trial detention, inmates who have not been um, convicted. You know, we have a number of them there, and it's the reason one third of the prison population in Ghana are remandees. They are the reason our prisons are choked. So the Chief Justice and the Attorney General's Department came together, they formed a group of uh, they so they have a team of lawyers or judges who go around prisons in the country hold special settings there and this started in 2007 they hold special settings there and they hear cases of remand prisoners so it's like taking the court to the prisons so everything that happens in the normal court happens in 
the uh, in the prison when the justice for a program is running. We are very excited about it because it has freed a number of people. I told you last year when I released the first Unlock the Forgotten, over 200 people, inmates, got their freedom. So it tells how it can work if we are to pump more resources into that. And it also gave some of the judges the opportunity to see the prisons for the first time. And I must tell you, some wept. Some wept when they saw conditions there, how they sleep, how they, they have been packed in small rooms, the food they eat, the water they drink, all those things. So the Justice for All program has made huge impact in Ghana and I've actually done a thesis on that, the Justice for All program and the prison remand population. I've done a thesis on that and from that the findings show that it's made a, uh, some huge impact in Ghana. All we need is to pump in more resources so that they can um, go around the country, prisons the country, not once, not twice, but like three times in a year. And that will help to congest the prisons. Um, they have been thanking me for unveiling conditions there in the prison. And I can say that through that documentary, you know, in the past, they didn't have um, vehicles, but over 100 vehicles have been given to them by the government. We've had a number of um, NGOs, a number of corporate bodies who have started donating towards um, the prison uh, reformation process. Um, we've had, for example, Fordham University coming on board to train um, some uh, of, not Fordham University, but an organization here in the United States uh, uh, training some prison officers. So there have been some changes. And they appreciate the fact that um, for the first time they even got the president to visit the prisons and increase their budgetary allocation. When the president visited the prisons, um, he went with the finance minister, and after they had seen conditions there, the government donated 50,000 cities, 50,000 cities towards um, the prison reformation process. So people are interested in the prisons now because they've realized that it can, it can be anybody's home. And I remember when um, they were launching the project of Fiasa. The president made an emphatic statement that it's about time politicians in, uh, spent time to renovate or revamp our prisons because, especially for pro uh, politicians, who knows, any of them can, can end up there. So if uh, they, they, they are to spend time and fix the prisons, the better it will be for, for them. So generally they have been happy, but certainly... Uh, especially with the police, some are not happy with me. I've had calls from a number of them who have complained about this, that um, I am getting robbers released into the system. So if there are more armed robbers in the system, I must be blamed. No, the Justice for Our program never release armed robbers. The Justice for Our program only goes to release people who have spent years in prison. You know, the uh, laws are clear. The Constitution states stipulates clearly that you must... Um, look at the case, you must try the person within a, a, a period of time. So if they have exceeded that period, why must they not be released? For example, if an offense somebody committed is there five years, and here's the case, the person had spent 10 years in prison, it means the person had, had served the sentence and had done five years more. So certainly such a person will be released. So definitely uh, the prisons have had a good time with the officers and the top hierarchy. Uh, but a session of the police, I'll say I'm sorry. So what viewers about watching is excerpts from the left to right documentary, the new one I've just done. Um, I decided to just capture this small portion as a teaser. So viewers, and uh, be mindful what you're going to watch. <laughs> Are you not? It will not be that. Um, fine with that. Some people, if you have courage, surely you can watch. So let's watch and come back. According to the United Nations standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, all countries have an obligation to observe certain basic human rights standards in their prisons. 
standards regarding the conditions of detention must be observed regardless of a state party's level of development. The UN demands a minimum floor space and cubic content of air for each prisoner, adequate sanitary facilities, clothing, which shall by in no manner degrading or humiliating, provision of a separate bed, and provision of food of nutritional value adequate for health and strength. <laughs> I decide to go around and check how far these standards are being met in this prison. The prison administration is supposed to provide inmates with food of awesome quality. More than one city, 80 pesos is needed to provide this kind of meal for inmates. For years, prisoners have been fed on one city, 80 pesos daily. Director General of the Ghana Prison Service, Emmanuel Ajato, says this amount is woefully inadequate. Until all these things are done, inmates will continue drinking watery porridge without sugar and either eat their famous gari, which goes with a kind of colored water mixed with palm oil, supposed to be palm nut soup, or banku, which goes with what I would describe as improvised granite soup. For a first hand information, the inmates, together with their officers, agreed to lead me to their places of convenience. The stench is extremely unbearable. Okay, so I have been here for just a few hours. The congestion is just too much. And because we are the background, they are not very good. It's the only time they see uh, people like us around, they will go to tell their stories. I am struggling to breathe as a result of the stench and heat here, all because I am a first-time visitor. Um, I wonder what asthma patients here go through. The remand population as of today is 625 and there are only four toilets here. Unfortunately, two of them are out of use now. This means the 625 inmates here share only two toilets. They form long queues in the morning to wait for their turn. At times, they do it on themselves. And just a few steps away from the almost half full water closet are scores of inmates preparing different kind of food from their make-believe palm nut soup. Before they can eat the gari provided them, they have to sieve and do away with some large particles in the gari. Remember, all these things are taking place not far from their toilet. I wonder what will happen when there is outbreak of cholera. Uh, as you can see, uh, this gentleman is possible to have uh, to have received food from him. Uh, so many family members were here to visit him and they brought him food. So he's sharing with his friends here. So he tells the difference between the food they eat here and the one we eat outside. I am back at the Kumasi prison. It is a few minutes past 4 p.m. and it is time for the inmate to be locked up so officers are conducting their last roll call. Inside the cells, the picture looks horrifying. Human beings packed up in a room with not even an inch space between them. They have been carefully arranged according to the years they have spent in the prison. The leader of this cell, Isifu Musa, says there are names for each sleeping position. Those in the middle are referred to as sardines because we have arranged them like the way sardines are arranged in a tin. There's no space between them. On my extreme right are the elderly and those who are not well. We call them tabo tabo. The aged sleep there. Those on my left, very close to the door, we call them pickups. 
they squat throughout the night. They are like passengers in a stationary vehicle. They can only get up when the gate is opened in the morning. For those on my left, very close to the wall, they have been here for over four years. Those under the belt are those who have not really stayed here for long. They have not gone beyond two years. Inmates on the bed are those who sweep here and ensure the place is clean always. Some are also peacemakers. Those on the top are the leaders. Thank you very much. Not all of them are criminals. Not all of them are criminals. And I know I know this very well. Some are there because they owe people. Some are there because they had a grudge with others. Some are there because they jump traffic light or red light. Some are there uh, for reasons they are not even familiar with. You understand? Some are there because they were in an environment where the police uh, were there to conduct swoops and they were picked up. So not all of them are criminals. Yes, the criminals ones are there, but not all of them. So imagine you owing somebody, you're unable to pay, the person reports to the police, you are sent to court, the court tells you, until you're able to pay, you have to go inside. Are we going to count you as a criminal? So if these people are not criminals, and even if they are criminals, as you said, they are humans. They are humans. There are standards. Standards. And we must respect these standards. If we say that we are law-abiding citizens, law-abiding country, we have rat uh, ratified, some of, ratified some of the UN conventions, and we are applying them, why are we not sticking to some of these principles in our UN conventions, in our constitution? The Constitution tells us clearly that you don't hold somebody unduly for long periods. So if we are holding somebody, uh, if we have remanded somebody, and the person has spent 13 years, 14 years, 10 years, is it fair? And it's all because we don't have lawyers. Even, uh, what, what is it, uh, uh, the legal aid system, the legal aid system is supposed to go to the aid of these people. We have just 21 lawyers working with the legal aid scheme in Ghana. So how can they help? There's nothing they can do. How can they travel across the breadth and length, uh, length and breadth of the country and help these people? So that's the issue we are facing. Not all of them are criminals. You, it can happen to you. You may, you may be stopped on the road by a police officer or you may accidentally knock down somebody. The person may, might die, may die. If the person dies, you have to prove in the court that you did not intentionally kill the person. And it can take you five years to get this proven. So for the five years, you're going to be in jail. And as I said, an accident. So it can happen to all of us. That's why we must all be concerned and pay particular attention to, to the prisons. You know, I keep telling people, it's a community. Everything we need in a community, we need those same things in the prisons. So they need water because they don't have water to drink, no bath. They need medicine. They have infirmaries, but they don't have drugs in their infirmaries. If you see some of them, some of them have mental conditions. They need to be sent to psychiatric hospitals. Some of them uh, uh, have scabies. Some of them have tuberculosis. If you see the bodies of some of them, they have... I don't know. 
<laughs> the title of the documentary was Left to Rot, so you should understand. Some die in there because they, they were not given the needed med medical attention. So please, if you can help, let's first get them drugs. Let's get them water. So I'm looking for people who will say that, okay, we are ready to adopt, for example, Kofredia prisons. We are ready to sing ball holes for them. Please come, and we're going to allow you to do that. If there are things you want to ship down, ship them down. Nobody will tell you to pay for the duty. The Fiasi project will take care of that. So anything, anything you want to bring down, just do it in the name of a project, a Fiasi or a Fiasi project. If you do that, all you have to do is to ship the whatever you have down, and we can clear from the port free of charge. We have waiver and everything awaiting anyone who wants to help. So please help me with water, help me with drugs, clothing, shoes, and everything. And I appreciate it. And they'll, be also, they'll also be grateful. If you want to reach Project Fiasse, I'm one of them. I was made an ambassador to the prisons last year. So you can reach Project Fiasse through me. My email address is seth.boaten at myjoyonline.com. Seth.boaten at myjoyonline.com. You can also call me or send me WhatsApp on plus 233-243-149-169. Plus 233-243-149-169. If there is something you can do to help them, help them now. Nobody knows. The prison can also be your home one day. <music> <music>